Hello, welcome to Engineers Ireland and uh, the second one of these talks on the sequences and series. This is the one that deals with the stylized ones which are the arithmetic series, the geometric and then a small look at the arithmetic or geometric one, just out of curiosity. Um, it's surprising how something this simple can actually or was actually quite hard to um, produce in the very beginning for people to actually come up with it and for example if we were to say uh, let's look at this sum okay and you were asked to add those yeah, you'd have been asked to add stuff like this we'd say back in national school and more than likely if you had um, a mischievous uncle or aunt they might have asked you to add all the numbers up to 279 for example trying to get you out of their hair for a while instead of annoying them when you were young well obviously when you go up to 279 of these numbers it becomes a real chore if you had to add millions of them it becomes a bit of a nightmare but it took a very long time for people to actually figure out an easy way to do this um, we could obviously say it's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 but is there a cute way and the cute way is to say okay I want this sum okay and the sum is going to be all of these and I have 1 2 3 4 5 6 I have 7 numbers here so it's the sum of these first 7 uh, natural numbers so well isn't the sum can't I rewrite it this way just in reverse order Now, let's add them. Over here on the left, I'm saying twice the sum of the first seven numbers. What is it equal to? Seven and one is eight. Six and two is eight. They're all eights. So, I have seven numbers. And they're all eight. Fifty-six. That's twice the series. So we can say that implies the sum of the first seven natural numbers is going to be 7 by 8 all over 2. Okay. Obviously we could say we could have added those but if I asked you for S 279 the first 279 numbers it would get a little bit more complicated. So what is it that we have over here? What we got was, this is how many numbers we had. And this is one more than it. Okay. So we would expect something like... And it gets divided by 2. That's a lot easier than adding up all of these different things. So then, we can actually come up with an expression that allows us to add up any amount of numbers of natural numbers. The interesting thing about these natural numbers is you will notice up here, they're obviously one bigger as we move through. 4 is 1 bigger than 3, 5 is 1 bigger than 4. So we're saying we have a common difference, and that common difference is 1. And we're saying we also have a start number, and in general these, the start number is called A. Okay. What can we say in general about these things? Let's now just use the notation that's normally used. Sn is the sum of the first n. In these things we talk about terms. So we'll write out our, let's say, numbers that we had already. And we'll go as far as n of them. And we're going to give these guys a name, term 1.
So the nth term is n in this case. The only difference between what, how we're naming this and the previous stuff is we used u before this, and now we're using t, the first letter of term. What other type of... This now, by the way, is an arithmetic series. What other type of arithmetic series is, do we have? The very first one in the last talk is another example of these, where Sn could have been, for argument's sake, and we'll just slightly vary it, we'll say 3 plus 5. And we'll say tick the 3 away from the 5, you're left with a 2. Take the 5 away from the 7, you're left with a 2. And here you're left with a 2. So we can say in this case that's the common difference. And because d is the first letter of difference, we will say d equals 2. We also know the value of the first one, and that's normally called a. So a is 3, and d is 2. How else can we write these things? term 1. That's going to be just a. That's the same as saying it's 3 down here. What's the second term? Well, there's no use saying it's 5, because that's just specific to this one here. But you see, what is 5? Isn't it the very first one? Plus the difference. So we'll say it's a plus d. Now let's look at the third one. You'd say, down here, okay, it was a 7, but how was that 7 made up? It was the very first one, and two differences. And what you should be noticing now, is that whatever number we have in here, there's one less over here. So we can write it, having got this far down, we have gotten to a point where we can write our general series, uh, sorry, general term. The nth one, then, we're saying, will be the first one plus n minus 1 of these differences. So that's nice and handy. It's easy to write. <coughs> so we can now actually instead of having played our game up here with just one particular um, series which was of the natural numbers let's play that exact same game again only now we're going to deal with terms that look like this okay like these guys here that's all we're going to do now We're going to add up a whole load of these guys. And we'll say the first one, and I'll write it up here in a pale blue T1, T2, and on. T1 we know is A. T2 we know is A plus D. Now, we know this guy over here, the last one. Okay. The one ahead of him has to be a plus n minus 2 d's. So we're all set up. We've, we have the thing written. And we want this sum. What we did the last time is we reversed our numbers and we'll do the exact same thing this time. We're saying Sn is also, and we're going to put the last one first and the first one last. Very biblical. We're saying it's A plus N minus 1 D. And that'll 
complete that bit. And we're saying plus, and we're going to pick the second last one now. Okay, that now gives us this set, and we'll go on and on and on, and now we'll use the second one from the front, which is the A plus D, which completes these guys. And we'll get another A. That's the same as done doing the 1, 2, 3, 4, across to 7, and then going 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We've just reversed the order. So now, let's add twice the sum that I'm looking for is now going to be equal to, what do I get from this first one here? I get two a's plus an n minus one d. That's this guy, all done. What do I get here? Two a's plus an n, oops. Because I have n minus 2 d's here, and I have another d here, so I have n minus 1 d's. And we go blah, 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 and I get 2a plus, again, n minus 1 d, and I get plus 2a Okay. Now, that's the nice position we want it to be in, where this and this, and this, and this, and all of the ones in between, in this space here, they're now all the same. So we're in a very happy position. I've got n of these. So I can say that implies twice Sn is n times outside of 2a plus Easy stuff. The mathematics in this is at best second year secondary school mathematics. So you've nothing to worry about here. And even the reasoning or how you can see through this, it's actually straightforward. So that's twice of what I wanted. I only need one of them. So I can say And that's the equation that you get in the book. It's a very important one. What I want you to notice though, just out of interest sake, in the same way when we looked at 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 7, and then we went 7 plus 6 plus 5, we found that when we did our totals, our total of 8 was 1 plus 7, okay, and 7 plus 1. That means it was the first one plus the last one. Now we find the exact same sort of thing here. If we look over here, up on the top right, and say, that was my very first term, just a, it's term one. Watch it over here, top left. And we say, hmm, that guy is the last term, it's tn. So I can say that, so, Sn is equal to n all over 2 outside of the first term plus the last term. That's an easier expression, but they generally don't use it in the books. I only am including it here because um, when you actually see that it is this simple, it makes it much easier for you to pay enough attention to this chapter to become a master of it because it's well worth it. The questions in the Leaving Cert are doable. Now you just pay attention obviously because it is leaving cert standard but they are doable and these are sections that pay lots of benefits to you especially leading into the special question. So we're saying this is a sum. Now it's a sum of a very particular type of thing called an arithmetic series.
sum of an arithmetic series is n over 2 outside of the first term plus the last term. Now then, what else do we need to know? If we go back again, and we'll say term 1, term 2, term 3, etc. We'll say term 1 was a, term 2, sorry, that's an a. It's a plus the common difference. Term 3 is a plus two common differences. We'll say to ourselves, hmm, the exact same as we said in the last talk that we had. Look at this now. Term 3 minus term 2. It's equal to a plus 2d minus and in general we can say tn minus tn minus 1. The difference between two consecutive terms is the common difference. That's really just restating the definition of what an arithmetic sequence is. What it would also tell you quite easily is, example, t7, the seventh term, minus t4, fourth term. You'd say, how many differences would be in there? Fifth, sixth, and seventh. It should be equal to three d's. Okay? We are told that we have three terms, consecutive terms. What we can do is call the middle one x. Okay, if we have one, another one, another one, we can call that one x. Now, what we know is that we have a situation where the difference between these two is d. Okay, we also know the difference between these two is d. So if this guy is called A and that one is called B, I can tell you that X minus A, that guy, is equal to D. And also Okay. And as it's stated in the books, this thing here is an arithmetic mean. You just add up numbers and you divide by the number of numbers. That's the arithmetic mean of the first and the third. When you get that, you've got the middle one. And that all stems from the fact that there are common differences. This is one of the little tricks that is used in solving the kind of problems I'll give you. Because again, like in algebra and in several other chapters, to add a bit more substance to the questions they can ask, what they'll do is um, they'll throw in a variable and they'll say, oh, k is in the middle or something like that. And all you are is you're back playing with algebra again. But this is one of the little tricks that's useful in it. Now, in these particular ones, these arithmetic series, there isn't really much more to them. They're actually quite straightforward. The second type of series is called a geometric series, okay? But before we get on to them, I just want to explain something to you. This will be one of them, of course. Look at this. And you can imagine that going on forever. Any idea what the sum of all of those things are? 
Now you're talking about an infinite number of these numbers. Okay? So we're saying sum to infinity of all of these numbers. What is the answer to that? Well, it turns out to be 1. I'm starting with this one because there's a very beautiful um, graphical proof of this. So we look at that first. This is a square and its sides are length 1 and length 1. And 1 by 1 is 1. So the area of this square is 1. Now then, let's look at half of it. The area of this is clearly a half. It's This length here is just a half. So area. And just so you're clear, we're talking about this. That area is a half. It's 1 by a half. Now let's cut off another piece. The area of this is a half by a half, which is a quarter. Now let's cut off another piece. This piece is going to be a half by a quarter because vertically its length is a half and horizontally its length is going to be a quarter so you'll get one eighth in here and we can just give a different colour to that now at this stage you should see how this game gets played when we divide this we get a sixteenth when we divide this again and on, and on, and on. And the whole thing disappears down into the corner. So, we actually have graphically shown that a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth plus a thirty-second plus blah 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 forever and ever and ever adds up to one. There are a few other very interesting ones of these. Um, here's the one that I particularly like. If we look at the sum of the first, uh, let's say, to infinity again, of a particular series, okay? It's going to be the, we'll write it the other version, the sigma version, okay? Where the R term can go all the way from, and I'll deliberately go from zero this time, up to infinity. What it's going to be, minus 1 to the power of r. So let's look at it. Minus 1 to the power of 0. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. Minus 1 to the power of 1. Anything to the power of 1 is itself. Minus 1 squared is plus 1. Minus 1 cubed is minus 1, and on. And we're saying, and on, non forever. A mathematician came along and he said, I can work out the sum of this. This would have been, we'll say, about 150, 170 years ago, that kind of time. And he said, what I'll do is I'll match these, I'll pair them. And that this pairing will go on forever. Now the nice interesting thing about this is he definitely has simplified things because now what is that equal to? It's zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus an infinite number of zeros. So he concluded, he said, S infinity of this series is zero. And he published. Well, it didn't take too long for someone else to say this. S infinity, and we'll write out our series again, is plus 1 minus 1. And 
we'll go on and on and on and on for this. And this guy, he did it a bit differently. Different. He said, let's leave out the first one and we'll pair up these two. Let's now pair up these two. Let's pair up these two. And he's saying, hmm, that's going to be equal to 1 plus minus 1 plus 1 is a 0. So he published that the answer was 1. That led to an absolute war amongst mathematicians because it seems that we have proved that 1 is equal to 0. It's worse than that. It means something equals nothing. They also considered that it meant that truth equaled falsehood. And it led to a serious argument that ran on for many, many decades. Now, what's the problem here? It's a concept that you have to deal with in the leaving cert, and the concept is infinity. Like, what is it? And what this problem comes down to is if infinity is even, then the first one shown in the blue here, where you bracket all the terms as you see them, will mean that if you were ever possibly able to get to the end of infinity, that you'd have exactly bracketed everything and the answer would be zero. In the second one, where the answer became one, if infinity was an odd number, then having left out one and bracketed everything else, you'd have an exact, we'll say an infinite number of, of pairs of numbers all getting zeros, and the answer is one. So which is it? Is infinity odd or even? I think it took them about 150 years to get over that particular one. What is the answer now? Let's have a look at it. We'll just rewrite the answers the two guys got. S infinity of the series we're looking at was equal to zero. S infinity of the series we're looking at is one. Let's add the two. Sorry, yeah. I said two, that's why I wrote two. This is the answer now. That the sum, and this is really odd, very strange, that the sum of a series that can only have numbers one and minus one, the sum that we accept now is a half. It's a compromise answer, and it's a compromise answer because nobody knows if infinity is odd or even. And it's certainly better than saying 1 is equal to 0, which means something is equal to nothing. And I suppose a half is better than nothing. It is just a compromise answer. So here, in your Leaving Cert course, you actually have a series that um, mathematics has never felt comfortable with. Again, this particular one, is a geometric series. But rather than coming up with kind of odd and interesting sort of ones of these, what we should do is start to look at them more uh, in a more systematic method. The arithmetic ones had a first one and every one the rest of them was found by adding a common difference. These guys are a bit different to that because they've got a common ratio. If you looked at even the very first series that I gave you there, which was the half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth, etc. What you'll need to do is say, how do I get this guy from that? You'd say, well, isn't it a half of the one ahead of it? How do I get this from this guy? Isn't it a half of the one ahead of it? And similarly, this is a half of the one ahead of it. Now, that we can happily call A again, and all the rest of them are found by multiplying the previous one by a factor, a ratio, okay? So what we'll say is this guy. Common ratio and we'll call it R, first letter of ratio. 
Mathematicians have a nice easy style of naming things whenever they're let away with it. So let's look at them now. We can say first term. We can call it A. Second one. Third one. Already, in having just written three of them, we are now in a position to be able to write the general term. Because what we can see here is when this is three, that's one less. When that's two, that's one less. So. Okay. What else do we notice? Let's look at T3 divided by T2. So, that's nice and handy. The next term, divided by the one just ahead of it, will give you your common ratio. <clears throat> so all of these things, in this case here, our ratio is a half. That's why they keep getting smaller. But I could say 2, 4, 8, 16. The previous one multiplied by 2 will give you this one. That one multiplied by 2 will give you the next one. There, the common ratio is 2. We can do all the usual playing around with these particular things. And in general, you will find at this level of dealing with the geometric series, what you're really getting is an opportunity to practice with these terms, and it's very worthwhile to do so. So it isn't worth my while actually going through some of these uh, simple questions, because the objective is for you to become familiar. How do we sum these guys? Sn. What is it equal to? And again, I'll write up on the top t1, t2, just to get you into the idea of what we're at. Okay. Now then, what can we do about that? Let's get r times the series. Now, we will, in the same way if you were dealing with geometry or algebra or anything else, any time you come across things that are polynomials, in other words, uh, a variable to a power, you always try to keep the ones with the same powers in line with each other. So r times the a will be a r, but if we write it directly below it, we'll just confuse ourselves. So we'll write it over a bit. So that actually comes from here. So the first term multiplied by r gives us a r. The next one is a r squared, which is that second term multiplied by the r. And you'll go all the way across and from this one here, you will get this. And now we've got one new term over here, which comes from this guy, when I multiply it by the r. That's handy. Now then, we'll take the second line from the first line. Okay, nothing 
is getting taken away from the A, so I'll get an A here. That cancels, that cancels, they all cancel all the way over. But over here, I have minus A R to the N. So that's dead handy, because we only have two little terms now. So what we can say is, that implies that 1 minus R, which is the stuff over here, that many SNs, is equal to A minus A R to the N which implies that Sn is equal to A minus A R to the N all over 1 minus R. Now if you remember, when we were dealing with the geometric ones, I was saying that when we got to the sum of the geometrics, that you can actually express the, ex the equation in terms of a number of terms. In this case here, that happens to be also t1 minus t n plus 1 all over 1 minus r. Just something to keep in your mind because this is the one that the book generally deals with. Okay. I do like to think of it this way because it's always nice to know that it comes back down to very, very simple things. Okay. In general, they will write this and there is a little disclaimer you have to have here because what you have to notice now is underneath the line I've got something minus something if my R is 1 then I have a 0 underneath the line and it's undefined and we'll say for all these R values not equal to one. Let's just see what we would have got if R was one, what kind of a series we'd have. We'll just write it down here. S A. First one is A. The next one is going to be A by one. So it's A. Now that's clearly not a geometric series. So there's no harm in this thing here. Uh, having the limit that r is not 1 because we're not dealing with a geometric series when r is 1. We're dealing with just sum up so many constants. So the equation then is obviously complete for all geometric series. What you will have noticed from the first example that you uh, we discussed, the one, the half, quarter, the 8th, 16th, 32nd, the 64th, etc., is everything started getting smaller when the r was less than 1. Okay. If we are looking at 2, 4, 8, 16, everything is getting bigger because the R in that case is 2. A term is twice the previous term. So they start getting bigger when the R is larger than 1. They start getting smaller when R is less than 1. And that's an important feature in these things. Let's look at the same kind of thing about three terms again. If we'll just say any three terms, and we're saying it's going to be A, X, and B. What do we know about them? And again, the trick here is we've named the middle one X. Okay, it's a usual thing. We know that any term is the previous one multiplied. Well, I'll, I'll write it over here. T N plus 1 is equal to R times T N. Okay, so we know that implies the common ratio, which is a constant, is equal to Tn plus 1 all over Tn. So we'll use this over here, and we will say x over a happens to be the common ratio, and that happens to be the same as b over x. And that simplifies down to... And this, as the books state to you, is the geometric mean. It's very interesting because when we were looking at um, induction, we actually looked at a relationship between the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean. Once again, the only kind of 
problems that really should be pushing you in relation to these once you've familiarized yourself by doing exercises is when they start to give you uh, unknown terms or they'll say to you oh the difference between the 17th and the 25th one you know still again what they're doing is messing around with algebra you are supposed to work your way through as many of those as possible I'm not particularly worried if you get caught out a bit on those because what you're looking at is algebra tricks and algebra is notoriously tricky we will obviously get on to um, answering just about all of the past 10 years worth of questions on these that came up in the leave insert so at that stage the things that might have been catching you up will become clear but it's essential that you practice now and familiarize yourself with these terms okay the next thing we need to do for these is to look at what happens if I have an infinite number of these geometric terms and this brings us into something that uh, gets introduced in this chapter and is brought in in several other chapters and that's limits okay we already noticed that the half plus a quarter plus blah 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 that it's summed up equal to one a very curious finding okay and we had stated here that the common ratio was equal to a half in this particular one and that is definitely less than one there's a few little limits that really matter to us here and you need to know how to write limits anyway so what we will say if a term the un term if it goes, if it starts to approach a certain number, okay? L. Guess where we got L? First letter of limit, okay? Now, L is an element of real numbers, okay? An important point. As this N value here, as that goes to infinity, in other words, we add more and more and more and more terms in the series, what actually happens? when this guy gets bigger and bigger well first off we have to learn to write it the limit as this n heads towards infinity of all of these okay it's l so in the actual as we head to infinity the value of the term is going to become l In this series up here at the top, a half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty-second, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's heading towards zero. We would expect the infinite one, the one over infinity, which is somewhat of a heresy, but let's stick with it. We're getting to a value which is just about, we could call, zero. You always have to get very careful when you deal with limits. You can talk about approaching the limit, but it's actually... In many cases, and you will find this out in calculus uh, when we're dealing with first principles, it is sometimes a heresy to talk about the actual limit, but you can talk about approaching it, and you can say approaching a certain value. So we're saying, as we go further and further along in a particular series, if the term approaches a, a limiting value, then we can define it this way. Are there special cases? And there are always special cases. The limit. As n heads to infinity. Of 1 all over the number to some power p. And we haven't decided what power p it is because it turns out to be not really matter to us at the moment. We're saying that's equal to 0. And it's for any value of p that's greater than zero so we're saying if I've got a power and so long as this power is greater than zero it could be a quarter it could be a power of five it makes no difference the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n to this power is going to be zero 
Now that's going to be a very useful thing from the viewpoint of working out the limits of a much more complicated type of expressions, okay? So let's look at one. What could we do about that? Well, we would like to get it, or parts of it, to look a bit like this thing over here. And the only way to do that is you look for the highest power of n in your expression, and it happens to be an n squared. It appears here, and it appears here. So what we will do is we'll multiply above and below by the n squared. So we'll say, well, that is equal to the limit n heads to infinity of 2 minus because 2 n squared divided by n squared is going to be 1 and the minus 5 n divided by n squared will give me minus 5 over n plus 3 over n squared and all of that is going to be over 4 because the n squareds cancel plus 1 over n squared now, oh, the nice thing about limits is the limit of a plus b is equal to the limit of a plus the limit of b. The same as the limit of a minus b is equal to the limit of a minus the limit of b. We can break things up. So now, we can actually borrow down into this, look at that guy individually, this guy individually and that one individually. Although those three are just like this common limit um, rule that we have up here. And we're saying as n goes to infinity, every one of those are going to go to zero. So we can say that it's equal to when n goes to infinity, now we we'll drop this funny limit looking sign out of the front and we'll say it's equal to 2 over 4 because it's 2 minus 0 plus 0 plus zero, and that is a half. Is that true? Remember, I keep saying this, and it's very important. We are learning maths at a certain level, okay? The leaving cert level. And we can think at that level and when we do our problems, we must think of that level. But we have to always keep really careful about things like signs and um, simple division, all that kind of stuff. So when you're just doing this, yes, you're almost home. But most accidents occur very close to the home, no matter how long the journey was. And it's the same in mathematics. An awful lot of the questions, you'll find that you lose marks right towards the end. Why? Because you said, yes, I have it, I know my answer, and then you come down along and you don't actually do it right. Be very careful when you get down towards the end, okay? As it turns out, it is a half. So we're all happy here. Okay. See the little game we played? We found the biggest power of n. As it turns out, it was the same in the top line and in the bottom line. There's two rules, or well, you could really say there's three rules. One of them is, if the same power is top and bottom uh, in an expression like this, you expect you will get a limit, like we got the limit of a half here. If the biggest power of n is underneath the line, you will get an answer. There is a defined limit. If the biggest power of n is above the line, then there isn't a limit, or you can say that it's it heads to infinity. 
because that's the basic rule. Now, you don't have to worry too much about it because it would all come out in the wash because if we had a one with something bigger, you would have the limit as n goes to infinity of, let's say, n. Well, if n goes to infinity, then the limit is going to infinity. We needed to to know this kind of stuff mm -hmm. so that we can move on to looking at um, the sum of an infinite number of terms of a series. And just before we'll get to that, mainly because Aidan Rountree went to the bother of pointing this out, I think it's essential that I point it out to you, sometimes you can get asked something like the limit as n goes to infinity. When you get a square root, what do you do? You put everything inside the square root. Okay. Now we do know, we'll come over here to the right, this is where you want to simplify things down so that you know what you're th talking about. If I have a, and we're now saying, imagining in our mind we're going to call what's above the line here as an a, I know that the square root of a squared is a. So that means I can convert this expression that I have here, this expression here, into the limit as n goes to infinity of the square root of okay and the nice thing about that is that happens to be the square root of oops And we can work out, in other words, we can happily go along and work out the limit of this stuff. And after we've got an answer, we get the square root of it. So now we're going to look at infinite sums of series. In the last talk, we discussed and we looked at teles telescopic series, things that you can telescope. Um, you can bring literally an infinite number of lines down into two, like two small expressions. As a general rule, if you can actually telescope a particular, um, the expression for the general term, if you can break it into two, something minus something, and then you can telescope the, ser the sum of those terms. If that's the case, you will have a limit. So that's always a good one to know. So anyway, he's saying, we'll take the shortcut on this one here. You were asked in terms of, this is the particular thing. We're saying that's the UN. And they do happen to make life easy for you and say, prove that it's equal to this. And all you do is you find your common denominator, which is this multiplied by that, cross multiply. And then when you work that out, you will find, oh, yes, it is this. And you say true, for example, when you have it worked out. And having done that, it means you're now legitimately allowed to use this side instead of that side. And the good news is it's in two bits, that bit minus that bit. And it looks ready. Uh, and very um, um, well placed to actually telescope down. So let's just look at telescoping down of this thing. And already we find that we have got to a situation where we've got the same thing out here as we had back here. And this is a minus one, as you can see. So we can say they're going to kill each other. 
this one will kill and all the way down along and because we only have one nice little term left up here at the front we only need to worry or concern ourselves with the very last one what we know is they've all proceeded taking everyone out in that line here so we will take out this one here and we're just left now down here in the same way as we have one term left up at the top we'll only have one term left at the underneath so we can say if I add them and that would be SN which is equal to the sigma of these UNs it's going to be equal to 1 over 2 minus okay now that's nice because we've got a nice simple series and if I'm saying what's the limit as the sum and I'm going to write across on the right hand side to try and keep everything together here now the next question is okay s infinity does it have a limit okay well if it does then this thing will have a limit okay we will do the exact same thing we did the last time we will find the biggest value of n in this term here we'll divide top and bottom by this n so what you will get down here I'll just bring it down you'll have 1 over n all over and you will have 2 outside of 2 plus 1 over n, over n now we know because it's one of these limits of 1 over n to the power of p we know that that goes to 0 and that goes to 0 so what you'll have is 2, or sorry, 0 over 4, which is 0. And that only leaves us with this guy. So the limit is equal to a half. Now that's really cute. We know if we can find the general term, and if we can split it into something minus something, and if that telescopes, we're all, we're just, well, we're told that we can take it that we have a limit and as you can see in this case we do now we're looking to see the infinite geometric series what happens to it okay what we did have before for a geometric series was it was equal to and they gave it this way And I was mentioning to you that it's equal to t1 minus tn plus 1 all over 1 minus r. <coughs> so then, we know that t1 is the first term. So that in itself is a constant. 1 is a constant and r is a constant. So the only thing that is worthwhile really looking at is the nth or the nth plus one term that kind of thing if that nth term heads to zero if it goes to zero as as we get further and further outline the series and head towards infinity well then what we know is if that goes to zero then you will have s infinity would be equal to t1 all over 1 minus r okay which is the a over 1 minus r that's what we'd hope to find. So if I was to get the limit of this, it's the same as getting the limit of this. That is the same as getting the limit of this. We know that t1 is itself. We know 1 is itself. That's itself. So we're actually, when we're looking for the limit of a sum of, an, of a geometric series, we are actually going to concentrate on what the TN approaches. What happens to it? <coughs> so
So let's look at what those bigger series, bigger values are like. We look at, we'll go back to what we had, a minus a r to the n all over 1 minus r, which is equal to, we'll just say, all of that I can forget about. And now we're just looking at minus a r to the n. You think of a number like r, and we'll say 2. 2 squared is 4. 2 to the power of 10 is a big number. And it gets bigger and bigger. Whereas if you look at number less than 1, a positive number less than 1, such as 0.9, you'd say 0.9 squared is 0.81. And now you move down again, and you start to find that the things get smaller and smaller and smaller. So the real issue is related to this guy, the value of r. And what you can find out is that the limit of a series S infinity will be equal to A 1 over 1 minus R, okay? If the absolute value of R is less than 1. Now you don't have to worry about the one case because we showed that that isn't a geometric series anyway. So if the absolute value of the ratio is less than 1, in other words if it's minus 0.8, if it's minus a half, plus a quarter, three quarters, any value, but once it's inside the range of minus one and one, we are actually going to have um, a limit to the sum of the series. And that limit to the sum of the series is a really easy one. It's this thing here. Couldn't be easier. Now I just I want two little things I want to cover now before we finish. One of them is something to be aware of, okay? Very simple little point. Sometimes they'll ask you to evaluate and they'll give it to you in the sigma form. It's not a problem, okay? for x greater than zero. Why am I mentioning this one to you? Well, I'm mentioning it and I'm going to show it to you in red. That's going from zero. Sometimes, most of the times when they give you these, n goes from one up. But other times they give it to you going from zero up. The first thing you gotta do is look at the range of values of n, okay? So there's a t0 term in this particular one. Whereas before we had a T1, T2, T3. We'll talk about a T0 term. So if that's the case, and if you had actually gone from n equal to 1, you'd have got it wrong. For example, just go back to the little example we had before, when we talked about a half plus a quarter plus an eighth, okay, and on and on. Well, we could say T1 term 2, term 3, and you'd say, what was t1? Okay, we know it was just a half, okay, and this one was a half by a half, and this one was a half by a half squared. So the general term here was a half outside of a half to the n minus 1, okay? If we were asked to do the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity, this would become a different series for ourselves. We'd be asked to do, let's say, a half to the power of n, going from 0. That becomes 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus. And we already know what that sums to. It sums all the way to 1. So this series has a sum of 2. And it has a sum of 2 because that's a 0. If this was a 1, it would have started here. And the sum would be 1. So be very, very careful 
always watch out for these things here. The last little thing, just out of interest, is there is something called an arithmetico geometric series. It's obviously kind of like a hybrid between the two you've been looking at, okay? And it looks like this. This is the example given in the book. Now, what you will notice is we can break this into two bits. Uh, I'm not saying this is proper maths, I'm saying we can look at it in two bits. Okay. And the other bit is So what we're saying is, this guy up here at the top, it's like it has a geometric series, that one, welded, or sorry, it has an arithmetic series, apologies, welded to a geometric series. So how do we find the sum of it? It's almost the exact same as what we were doing with the other ones. So let's look at it. That's in. Okay. That's the sum we're looking for. What we're going to do now is we're going to get x times s in. And you're going to find out what is that going to be equal to. The exact same thing as when we're dealing with the geometric series where we multiply by r. We're going to play the same trick here. And for the same reasons, we want to keep our x squareds together and our x cubeds together. So this term multiplied by x will give me 2x squared. That term multiplied by x will give me 3x cubed plus blah, 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 blah. And now, what do we finish up with? <coughs> you have your 2x, which is just bringing... This guy down here got nothing, nothing I took taken away from him. Now, different to the geometric where everything else in the middle disappeared, they don't disappear here. But what you get now is a single x squared, a single x cubed, etc., 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 and you will go on the way. Now, the important thing is we do know what this thing is. That's a geometric sequence. We know it's some, okay? And all we have to do is to add that to the 2x. And we are saying, hmm, all of that is equal to sn minus x sn. So then, the only trick here is to recognize that while these things didn't disappear, like they do for a geometric series, when you just multiply by this common ratio kind of bit, even though they didn't disappear, we've managed to simplify down an arithmetic or geometric um, series into a number or a factor and a geometric one. And you just straight off use the equation for the geometric one and out pops an answer. In the books you will find that they give you examples of um, how you deal with recurring decimal places and stuff like that, okay? 
it is worth your while to practice these because when we get to look at these we will obviously be looking at the leaving cert questions on it and if you guys haven't practiced enough you'll get lost I'm repeating it again okay anyway the good news is there are lots of exercises in these chapters to keep you guys busy so this is the end of the material that needs to be covered for the Leaving Cert in series and sequences in the two questions that are in paper one but it's not the end of series and sequences or limits the limits show up in calculus and the special question is not calculus it's calculus and series further calculus and further series so if you learn what's in this particular talk and the last talk and you practice that special question becomes very simple okay bye now